icy worlds. The solar system has many of those. From Dione to Europa, from Callisto to Enceladus, bodies made up primarily of water ice rather than rocks or gas are numerous in outer space. Water remains one of the most common substances in the universe after all, so low density bodies are often rich in it especially in the further reaches of planetary systems beyond the frost line, where bodies are primarily formed from less dense materials. These worlds are very common. Of course, the Ojoran system will also follow this trend and feature its own set of icy worlds. Hello everyone and welcome back to Project ESPA. My name is Yiji Online, and in this series I document the process of my world building project, ESPA. Thus far in the series, we have focused on making ESPA star system, a wide separation trinary star system with the sun-like star Oger at its center, which is being orbited by two red dwarfs at a far distance. Oger itself has nine planets, the fourth of which is the gas giant Manta, the system's main Jovian shepherd, and over twice as massive as Jupiter. In the last couple episodes, we've been building Manta's sextuple moon system, and so far, two of the six major moons are done. And today, we're going to build the third one, the icy world of Sanu. Like Idemei and Tora, Sanu was originally based on a procedurally generated moon and space engine when I built the first iteration of the Mentonian system in 2017. Originally called Siana, it was a ringed ocean world, being almost the size of the Earth but with less than half of its mass. It was a stunningly beautiful world, and even was the logo of the now defunct CWP. But, as with most procedurally generated worlds in Space Engine, even though it looked pretty, upon closer inspection the realism was atrocious. While conceived as a water world, its mass over volume resulted in a density of 0.37 grams per cubic centimeter, roughly a third that of water. Yeah, a water world far less dense than water. Makes perfect sense, right? To make that work, the interior of the world would have to be a lot less dense than the surrounding ocean, which is just not how worlds or buoyancy works. Also, despite orbiting around Manta, at almost 5 astronomical units from Ojor, a star weaker than the Sun, the ocean was entirely liquid. No ice caps whatsoever. I guess the moon managed a greenhouse effect of 200 degrees somehow? I can see what I was trying to go for, but seriously, a water world this warm cannot feasibly exist in this place. It having a ring was not inherently unrealistic, because at the time I had not established a resonance chain for Montes moons. I mean, I definitely should have, so that's a fall in its own right, but the current Mentonian system does have that resonance link, which would make such a ring system, though not impossible, at least highly unstable. All by all, Siana was one of my most beautiful worlds I created. But looking at it today, I cannot justify this. And out of all my past worlds, this one will have to be changed the most dramatically. Alright, so once again I've got my work cut out for myself. Sano is far too cold to have a liquid surface ocean, but is definitely still set up to have a large fraction of its mass be water. Concentrated near the surface due to the effects of buoyancy. Due to the cold, the entire ocean would simply freeze over, producing an ice world similar to Europa, Rhea or Enceladus, having an icy crust but hiding a liquid subglacial ocean beneath. Let's also try and squeeze in some cryovulcanism. While we are getting further out from Manta with each moon, the tidal forces and radiation on Sanu will still be significant, providing fertile ground for activity in the ice crust. So let's try to cook with that idea. And finally, Siana's name has a not so creative reference to its global sea in it, which after today is not going to exist anymore. Given the new character of this world, I think it's fitting I tweak the name a bit to take that reference out. So let's call this moon Sanu moving forth. So all the way back in episode 6 of the series, which is almost half a year ago by now, oh my, I made this template sheet of the Mentonian moons, which already establishes the core parameters for Sanu, a new mass of 3 times that of the moon, making it the most massive of Manta's moons. 
because the moons decrease in density the further out they are from the planet, it means that Sanu will also be the biggest of Manta's moons, having a diameter of 5182 kilometers, making it only slightly smaller than Ganymede. This then gives the moon a density of about 3 grams per cubic centimeter, which is almost identical to Europa. And indeed, at this density we can expect a large part of the moon's mass to be water ice, which, due to the effects of buoyancy, will gather primarily at the surface. Furthermore, its orbit is also already established, from which we can derive its effective temperature at roughly 195 degrees below zero. While various factors could swing this a couple of degrees in either direction, it should go without saying this is far too low to have liquid water at the surface, which again is pointing us in the direction of an ice world. This low temperature is facilitated by Sanus high albedo, which reflects a lot of heat back into space, resulting in a much colder surface temperature than the other moons of Manta. All things considered, Sanu is shaping up to be very similar to Europa, a frozen ice world, albeit a lot larger. Sano is said to have a surface gravity of 0.22 g's, nearly double that of Europa, and this higher gravity will cause its interior to be more compressed. While Europa's core is estimated to contain between 20 to 30% of the world's mass, Sano's core would likely exceed this to perhaps 35 to 40%. Due to Sano's advanced age of 5.8 billion years, the core would likely be unable to produce a mentionable magnetic field. This mostly solid core would then be enveloped by a less dense rocky silicate mantle, which in turn would be covered by Sanu's global water ocean. Sanu's ocean would be a lot deeper than Europa's because of Sanu's compressed interior. While we don't know for sure, it's estimated Europa's ocean is between 50 to 90 kilometers deep. Sanu's, on the other hand, would probably exceed that, reaching depths between 100 to 130 kilometers deep. At these depths, the pressure would reach twice that of the Challenger's deep. I know that feels like it should be more, but the gravity is lower, so yeah, that's the best we're gonna get. Then at the surface, the bitter cold would freeze the ocean surface, wrapping the whole world in a thick ice sheet. While estimates vary, Europa's ice sheet is estimated to be between 15 to 45 kilometers thick in places. Considering factors like Sanu's age, increased tidal forces, size, and heat retention, it's plausible the sheet could be a tiny bit thicker here, maybe between 20 to 50 kilometers, though in localized places it could be much thinner. In 2015, the Cassini mission performed a flyby of the Saturnian moon Enceladus, another icy world thought to have a subglacial ocean, and it sampled the composition of water plumes ejected by its geysers. While seawater on Earth has a purity of roughly 96%, the plume samples of Enceladus were much less than that, around 90%. The reasons for that are numerous, but one of the major factors is freeze concentration. As the surface layer of the water freezes, the remaining liquid below will decrease in purity. Given Sanu's advanced age of 5.8 billion years, its ocean purity can be assumed to be below 90%. Based on the samples from Enceladus, we can expect the water on Sanu to be a lot more salty. Briny even, with a plethora of salty ions like chlorine, natrium, phosphate and bicarbonates. Additionally, we can expect amounts of methane and ammonia dissolved in the mixture. These two are common in the outer reaches of planetary systems, and when dissolved in water act as a strong antifreeze, with especially ammonia substantially lowering the melting point of the ocean by about 20 or even 25 degrees. This is one of the reasons that help the ocean remain liquid below the ice, despite the cryogenic temperatures at the surface. Over 100 kilometers below the ice sheet, we reach Sanu's ocean floor. Pressures here could reach into the 2000 to 3000 bars, two or three times those found at the Challenger's Deep. At those pressures, the water would be pushed into forms of exotic ices, forced solid not by temperature, but by pressure. Not to say the brine's temperature would not be below freezing point anyway, though. The seafloor would also be the upper layer of Sanu's mantle, which means heat. While Sanu's core at its age is not heated by radioactive decay anymore like the Earth's is, the strong tidal forces on the moon still generate heat through friction inside the world. 
As seawater seeps into the seafloor, it is heated and escapes back up through extensive fields of hydrothermal vents, similar to those that we find on Earth near mid-ocean ridges. Except that where on Earth these are primarily found near tectonic fault lines, on Sanu they would be much, much more common all across. As ejected warm water rises upwards and cold water sinks, this creates convection currents in the ocean driven by thermal buoyancy, which have a major effect on the ice sheet above. Due to the bitterly cold 195 degrees below zero surface temperature on Sanu, the top layer of its ocean has frozen over to a depth of 50 kilometers, covering the whole moon in a glacial ice sheet that ranges anywhere between 50 to 10 kilometers in thickness. Now that's quite the range, and indeed the ice sheet could vary quite a lot in its thickness locally depending on what currents dominate in the convective ocean beneath. Because of these convection currents in the ocean, the ice sheet will become fractured, similar to how plate tectonics work on top of a convective mantle here on Earth, so too will ice tectonics take shape on top of Sinus convective ocean. In real life, a similar case can be prominently observed on the Jovian moon of Europa, which has a cracked ice sheet marked with distinctive red linea. These linea are best equated to tectonic fault lines on Earth and show familiar strike-slip faulting like mid-ocean ridges, hinting at convective currents beneath the ice. Due to the strong tidal forces, greater elastic energy stored in a thicker ice sheet and radiation damaging the crystalline structure of ice, the ice sheet on Sanu will also be cracked, showing a slightly greater number of these linea than we see on Europa. On Europa, these linea appear mostly red-brownish, a color thought to be primarily caused by the exposed salts and impure ice being irradiated at these fault lines. Sanu could take on very different colors though. As not to make the moon look too similar to Europa, let's go for white, grey and even some bluish hues. Given Sanu's advanced age, as well as its colder surface temperatures, its ice will achieve a much higher purity than that found on Europa, appearing bright white, aiding in the moon's high albedo and providing a limited contrast against these linea, which will not stand out as much from space. Since the ocean below Sanu's ice sheet has convection currents, it could have one more spectacular effect. Cryovolcanism. When a rising warm current hits the ice shelf, it melts away at the bottom, thinning and weakening the ice sheet, embedding subglacial lakes, aquifers and vents into the ice. Below and inside the ice sheet water pressure remains high, so that when ice tectonics then crack the sheet open and such a body of brine suddenly becomes exposed to the near vacuum conditions at the surface, it violently depressurizes, generating a steam explosion. This process distinguishes itself from terrestrial volcanism in that it does not evolve buoyancy. Whereas liquid rock slowly rises upwards in the crust due to buoyancy, water is less dense than ice and is exposed by tidal forces rather than buoyancy. And as such, this process is referred to as cryovolcanism. Cryovolcanism has been observed on icy worlds in the outer solar system, most prominently on Enceladus, where a field of cryovolcanoes near its southern pole were seen ejecting plumes of cryovolcanic debris directly into space, creating Saturn's E-ring. Most of these eruptions are explosive in nature, with effusive flows being rare. As the ejected cryolava is exposed to the extremely cold surface temperatures, it will freeze rapidly, resulting in regular surface renewal, keeping the ice planes pure, white and fresh. Aided by the moon's low gravity, fine debris particles could travel huge distances before settling down on the surface. Volcanic snow, which in this case is, well, just regular snow I guess, covering the top layer of the ice sheet, keeping it fresh and reflective before dust and other impurities can cover it. Some of the ejecta might even escape the moon's gravitational pull entirely, generating a faint belt of water ice particles trailing the moon in its orbit. As radiation hits the surface of Sano, it frees up hydrogen and oxygen from the ice through radiolysis, which would create an extremely trace atmosphere enveloping the moon. Most of the hydrogen would easily escape into space, resulting in a trace but oxygen dominated atmosphere. Any additional molecules would be provided from the cryovolcanic outgassing, which could add small amounts of nitrogen and ammonia to the atmosphere, overall achieving a pressure of at best a few microbars.
In the episode on Ideme, I concluded that estimating a precise radiation value is challenging. Based upon what we can measure in the Jovian system, we estimated Ideme's surface radiation to roughly approximate 140 sieverts a day. A very rough number that we can then use to estimate the radiation on the other Mentonian moons using the following drop-off formula. Now I made an error here, assuming the decay factor n to be linear, which it is not. Based on the Jovian field, the decay factor n is most probably between 3.5 and 4 and not 2, which means my previous estimate of 45 sieverts a day on Tora was inaccurate, and instead would be closer to 25 to 27 sieverts a day. Still intense and sufficient to support its radiotrophic life, but less than the 45 sieverts stated in that video. Using this new decay factor, at Sanu's distance to Manta, the magnetic field has dropped significantly in strength. While still subjecting the moon to an agonizing 4.5 to 5.2 sieverts per day, this is only slightly lower than Europa's 5.4 sieverts a day, and a lot lower than Io's 36 sieverts a day. At these strengths, its equatorial aurora would become very faint and mostly shift towards ultraviolet wavelengths, becoming invisible to the naked eye. Sanu is the third component in the 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 resonance chain of moons orbiting Manta, completing one orbit for every 2 of Tora and every 4 of Ideme. It orbits the gas giant at almost 800,000 kilometers every day and 21 hours and is tightly locked. It's 5100 kilometers across, making it the largest of Manta's satellites, and with a mass roughly thrice that of the moon, it's got a surface gravity of 0.22 g's and a density of roughly 3 grams per cubic centimeter that reveals a composition rich in water ices. Sano is a bright, icy world very rich in water. The surface of the moon is a thick glacial sheet, 30 to 50 kilometers deep, which hides a liquid briny subglacial ocean that extends up to 130 kilometers below the ice sheet. The tidal interactions with the other moons in the resonance chain generate heat inside the world, which powers convection currents in its ocean, which in turn weakens and cracks the ice sheet creating ice tectonics and spectacular cryovolcanism, resulting in dynamic surface renewal and the ejection of cryolava into space. Like Ideme and Tora, Sano is subject to radiation from Manta's magnetosphere, but at this distance it's weakened to only 4 to 5 sieverts a day, not enough to provide it with bright equatorial auroras like Ideme and Tora have. Nevertheless, in its sky Manta appears 22 times larger than the Earth's moon. Let's get to the comment of the day, which is by Niobium Oxide. Peak, I really love alien biology, especially exotic biochemistry. You managing to make plausible silicon-based life is something really impressive and to be proud of, as you need a lot of intellect to do this. Every single aspect was cool as hell, and I really hope to see this kind of exotic biochemistry again in this project. Well, I really enjoyed working on the Toran Live episode. I've been a lurker in the speculative evolution community for a couple years now, so I was excited to finally contribute something myself. That said though, it will probably be a while until we revisit Tora in this project. As I said in the video, I feel multicellularity for exotic life like that on Tora would be very implausible, so what is shown in the video is probably the evolutionary dead end for it. Fortunately, Tora isn't the only body in the Ojoran system that will host life. This is Project Espa after all, and even though I'm focusing on working out the system first, there will be plenty of interesting things ahead for when we eventually start working on Espa itself. Nevertheless, I really want to take my time to make a feature-rich universe before rushing towards any goal like that. Unlike with comparisons or science edu videos, I can see myself still working on Espa in 10 years time. So I hope you all will stick with me on this journey as we continue to build up this fictional universe. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed the episode, go show it some love by hitting that like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you know what to do, smack that subscribe button for more world crafting. I wish you all a wonderful holidays and a happy 2026, and I'll see you all in the next episode.